revival that took place in the 15th year of Asa's reign was very, very different from the other revivals that we read about in the Old Testament. Um, biggest reason is that it didn't come after a time of famine or apostasy. This is not, you know, the typical when there's a famine in the land or a pestilence in the land or, you know, any kind of an enemy that comes. If you seek my face and turn from your wicked ways and come into the temple and pray, uh, this is a revival that happened during a time of what has been called religious reformation. In fact, in my Bible, the heading of chapter 15 says the reforms of Asa. Ernest Baker wrote a book called The Revivals of the Bible in, in 1906. And I just want to read you a paragraph of what he said about this revival. He said, it was not occasioned by national adversity that caused the people to turn to God in despair. But it came after a season of increase, increase, I should say, and prosperity. After a great national victory and deliverance. During the two preceding reigns, the worship of Yahweh had been pushed into the background and the erection of idols and places for their worship had proceeded with the active support of the rulers. Upon Asa's ascension to the throne, ecclesiastical reform was immediately effected. The state policy was reversed. The people were commanded to observe the law of God and an active campaign against idolatry was instituted. I want to talk about this a little bit as we kind of introduce this tonight. And like I said, I, I think we'll get through all of it, but be patient with me if you would. There's a difference between reformation and revival. What's the difference? Generally speaking, in times of reformation, God's word forms the basis of action and thinking and living. There's a greater emphasis on doctrine, right doctrine. If you think about the Great Reformation, uh, the Martin Luther Refor uh, Reformation, what was the big fundamental change that happened during that? We went from dominance of the Roman Catholic Church with all of its sacramentalism and a belief in salvation by works and, and a central concentrated authority top down um, that really held all of its adherents as prisoners almost, you know. The priest controlled everything and up the line to up ultimately the Pope to an understanding, and, and the battle cry of the Reformation was, the just shall live by faith, salvation by the five solas, by faith alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the word of God alone, the Bible took supremacy over the church decrees and dogmas for the glory of God alone. Those are the five solas. Sola, Fide, sola gracia, sola scriptura, sola Christe, sola gloria, Deo, sola Deo gloria. Yeah, gloria Deo. Yeah, glory to Deo. Um, so that led to a return to moral living in a time of religious resurgence. Okay? So there was a correction in the teaching and the direction of the church. All right? or in this case, in, in Israel. Revival, on the other hand, is a work of the Spirit of God. It begins by a move of the Spirit in the hearts of the people when there's brokenness and contrition. It's kind of saying the same thing. Contrition means brokenness. Repentance. Repentance is the key word. Along with that, making restitution. Let those who stole steal no more, and by the way, give back. What did Jesus say? Uh, uh, John the Baptist said, if you have two coats, give one away. If you've stolen anything, pay it back. You know? 
and we saw that in uh, demonstrated in Zacchaeus, for instance. You know, he said, "If I've stolen anything, I'll pay it back fourfold." <laughs> Zacchaeus was a tax collector. If I've stolen anything, that's kind of comical. If what do you mean if? But at any rate, making a restitution, a desire to live differently, and here's the key, sadly, for a time, revivals don't last. It's like the waves coming into the shore. There's a, a, a wave that comes in, it fades out again. Our depravity always rules in our heart, and we, we turn back to our old way, and, and so we need it again. It's, and, and God, by his grace, has sent revivals throughout history. It's been a long, long time since we've had a, a massive revival, but we're praying for that. And we're hoping for it. So Asa's religious reforms continued really for 15 years before the revival came. Uh, this revival was in uh, Judah, Judea. It was about 25 years before, just to give you a time frame, before Elijah came on the scene in, north, in uh, Israel, in the north. Uh, about 35 years after the separation, the division of the kingdom north and south after the death of Solomon. So this is one of the earlier revivals. Again, we're we're not we haven't been taking these in chronological order. We've been kind of going more thematically. The theme of this revival was in uh, verse two: "The Lord is with you while you are with Him. If you seek Him, He will be found of you." It's time to seek the Lord. Uh, Lord willing, I'm going to preach another message next week that says just that. It's time to seek the Lord. Break up your fallow ground. It's time to seek the Lord. And it will be kind of a follow-up to this message. What happened in this revival? There was, first of all, a time of religious reformation and then followed by a revival. So I want to ask a question tonight. And I want us to think about this. In the 1980s, the Southern Baptist Convention went through what we call the conservative resurgence, okay? I don't dispute that name. I want to ask you to think about what really happened in that time. Was that a revival? Was it a reformation? What was it? Was it real? Did anything really happen? There's a couple things we need to understand about this that ties right into this revival tonight. Number one, God is sovereign. We all know that, right? What does that mean? God is sovereign. Absolute control. He's in absolute control of everything. He doesn't need any help. We looked at that this morning. He doesn't need any help to bring about a revival. In other words, there doesn't have to be a calamity that gets us in the mood and gets us crying out. God can come and move at any time in the life of a church, in the life of a nation, God can bring revival under any kind of circumstance, good or bad. The other thing about it is, the need for revival seems to imply that there's a problem. And I would agree, certainly, that there is a problem. That problem isn't always apparent to us. Just as the Bible says that the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things, who can know it? The Bible tells us that God sees the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God sees the heart. So what really happened in the 1980s? Most of us would look back to that time and think that was the heyday of Christianity in America, in recent history anyway. Maybe not as great as back in the 50s or the 40s or the, you know, back in the good old days of Southern Baptist expansion. But the 1980s, for most of us, was a pretty good time. Our churches were full. People were coming back to church. There was the, the Reagan Revolution that was happening. There was a conservative political movement, not just in the United States, but with Lech Walesa in Poland and Pope John Paul in Rome. Even the Catholic Pope was involved in this. Margaret Thatcher in Great Britain. And conservatism was on the rise, and there, a rise, and there was a return. There was a, a rejection of the 
abortion policies of the 70s and a lot of the immorality, the sexual revolution. There was a, con a return to conservative values in society. Did anything happen in the church that wasn't just riding the wave of conservatism across the country? Political conservatism. Now, I would argue that yes, there were some wonderful, really good things that happened, especially in our semin seminaries, seminaries, okay, in the 1980s and into the 90s. But most of us experience the change and a rise in church attendance. But here's the question. Were we walking with God and submitting to his word? I would argue that evidently what's happened since then, no, not so much. Because we still had doctrinal arguments. We still had people saying, and, and the thing that I heard in the 90s and into the 2000s and especially after we moved down here into uh, an area listen we had uh, so many more churches in this area than there are up north so many more we have one church in McHenry now McHenry is smaller than Decatur but in Decatur when we moved here there were about 20 Southern Baptist churches in Decatur okay now I think we've got 20 in our entire association we've lost a bunch but they were far better attended. It was nothing. We, I remember one of the first nights we lived in town, we were out with Sarah, and someone came over and said, oh, is this your daughter? What's, we said, well, she's got cerebral palsy. And I said, could we pray for her? We were in that place that used to be uh, Godfather's over, it was, what was it, the Grinder place? What was the name of that place? I don't remember what I'm talking about. Anyway, um, we're having dinner. People were coming up and asking if they could pray for us. People, I mean, everybody went to church, supposedly. And yet, the thing that characterized the Christian, the conversations I had with church people in Decatur for the first couple years we were here was, well, I know the Bible says, but there wasn't any submission to the Word of God. The Bible wasn't in anybody's authority. It was all about, let's have concerts, let's have entertainment, Let's have, you know, big parties and send the youth group out on activities. And, and boy, I mean, every other, once a month we had to cancel evening service because we were going to go bowling or something at the church down there. And, and, you know, when we tried to introduce spiritual conversations, well, people didn't want to hear that. Don't bother me with that stuff. And this is what we encountered in an area that was much more steeped in Southern Baptist life than where we had come from. And so I would question whether the Southern Baptist Convention went through really that big of a change at that time. We had nice buildings and property and finances and ministry centers were being built and lots of activity and lots of concerts. And back then everybody was involved in upward sports and all these kind of ministries. And, but, you know, God sees the heart. He sees it all. What's hidden from us under the surface, God sees. So we need to not be fooled. What moral effect is the preaching of the word having on us as a church people? One of the big events in the 1990s, ecclesiastically, church-wise, was the so-called Brownsville Revival. Down at the Brownsville Assembly of God Church in Florida, Pensacola, Florida. Thousands and thousands of people came in. This started on Father's Day of 1995, and supposedly it ran through the 2000s. Uh, I've talked to people that studied that, and, and some who had been there, and they said that you know one of the things that happened in Pensacola was the nightclubs and the bars were doing a whopping business during that time because of all the tourists that were coming down ostensibly to go to the revival and then at night after the revival was over they went out for some entertainment I in contrast to that and the revival that happened at the turn of the 1900s into the early part of the 1900s when Billy Sunday was coming around when Billy Sunday came to Decatur and preached every student at Millican College was saved all of the bars in Decatur were shut down 
Everyone, there was no alcohol being served at that time. Not because of prohibition, but because Billy Sunday came and all the bars went out of business. There was a, a moral effect that happened as a result of the preaching of God's word. Asa, in this text, was pursuing what was good and right in the sight of God. Turn back to chapter 14. Look at verse 2. Asa did what was right and good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. And he removed the altars of the foreign gods and the high places and broke down the sacred pillars. And he cut down the wooden images. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to observe the laws of the commandment. He also removed the high places and the incense altars from all the cities of Judah. And the kingdom was quiet under him. He built fortified cities in Judah. For the land had rest, and he had no war in those years, because the Lord had given them rest. Isn't that wonderful? Verse 7, Therefore he said to Judah, Let us build these cities and make walls around them, and towers and gates and bars, not that kind of bars, um, while the land was yet before us, because we sought the Lord our God. We have sought him, and he has given us rest on every side, and so they built and prospered. You saw it in, in the text where we read. It said that the nation destroyed. Uh, they, they had decreed by law that the people fors forsake their idols and worship the true God. Tremendous amount of building was going on. The land was secured on every side. Towns were literally being rebuilt and remodeled and repaired. Public works were being promoted. A lot of stuff happening. Generally, prosperity is thought to follow revival. Generally. You've even seen, in many cases, it's even seen as a result of revival. You know, materialism and prosperity are celebrated. That's one of the sins of the heathen that we allow to creep into the church. It's not always necessary for God to bring calamity upon us to get our attention. Romans 2 and verse 4 is a verse we ought to highlight and underline. Do you despise the riches and goodness and forbearance and long-suffering of God, knowing that the goodness of God, listen, the goodness of God leads you to repentance? So Asa had been pursuing God. The key phrase in this section is he sought the Lord. It occurs 29 times in the book of 2 Chronicles. Nine times in these two chapters alone, chapter 14 and 15, and out of 48 verses, nine times it says he sought the Lord. To seek the Lord is a favorite phrase of the writer of the Chronicles, including, of course, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. And we've been looking at these. If my people will what? Humble themselves. We saw that under Josiah last week. Josiah, the eight-year-old king. If my people will pray. That was the first message we looked at under Jehoshaphat, chapter 20. If my people seek the face of God, we're going to talk about Asa tonight. If my people repent, return to me, we saw that two weeks ago under King Hezekiah in chapter 30. All of these principles are illustrated in, in the book of 2 Chronicles. So, in the third, first 30 to 35 years after the division of the kingdom, God sent three separate teaching prophets to Judea. The first was Shemaiah, in chapter 12, he spoke to King Rehoboam on the matter of humbling himself. And then, in this context, chapter 15, Azariah, we read the text, spoke to Asa to seek the Lord. And then in chapter 17, we'll look at uh, briefly tonight, uh, Hanani came and spoke and urged Asa to return and rely on the Lord. So three messages, three promised results. Number one, in your outline, the promise was God's rest and peace. We saw that in chapter 14. Shemaiah had warned King Rehoboam at the, to set the stage for this section. Back in chapter 12, in verse 2 and 5, uh, it happened in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, came and against Jerusalem because he had transgressed against the Lord. In verse 5, 
Shemaiah the prophet came to Rehoboam and the leaders of Judah who were gathered together in Jerusalem because of Shishak said to them, Thus says the Lord, you have forsaken me, therefore I have also left you in the hands of Shishak. So God had turned them over and he humbled himself. And the people were subdued. Uh, the, the word humbled himself in this context is the word kana. It's used in 2 Chronicles 14 times to refer to a religious bowing down before God, including that's the word that's used in uh, verse chapter 7 and verse 14. Humble yourself, kana. Okay, so what does it mean? What does it mean to seek the Lord? Well, I suppose we can contrast what was going on and talked about in Leviticus where it says, give no regard to mediums or familiar spirits. Don't seek them to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. God says, don't look outside of the scriptures for spiritual counsel. Positively, he says in two places, 1 Chronicles 16 and 11, and also in Psalm 105 and verse 4, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face forevermore. And we've talked about this, how to seek the face of God refers to connection, communication, the communication organs, the mouth, the eyes, the ears are part of the face. You know what face is, right? Everybody had a Mr. Potato Head. I'm sorry, Miss, Ms. Potato, or uh, what's, what's the new genderless pronoun? The, a, a potato head, I guess they call them now. To seek God means the same thing. Seek his face. Make a connection. It's a call to repentance. Amos 5 and verse 4, Thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. You see, that connection is the essential part of spiritual life. Jesus talked about the vine and the branches. In uh, Psalm 115 and 135, he said, Don't seek idols, saviors that can't save. Isaiah 45, 20 says, They have no knowledge. They carry the wood of their carved images. They pray to gods that can't save. How ridiculous. <clears throat> what do we invest our time in and our energies and our efforts in that can do us no possible good? I mean, it absolutely is, as Solomon said, vanity. It's a waste of time. How much time do we waste chasing, as he said, chasing the wind? Chasing the wind. Jeremiah 29 and verse 12 said, You will call upon me and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. We talked about that last week, how it had to be a matter of priority. Seek first the kingdom of God. It had to be a personal thing. Individually, we seek God. Isaiah 55 and verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. What's involved in seeking the Lord? Wholeheartedly turning to God with an inner attitude of devotion to serve him. We're not playing here. We're going to talk about worship when I get back from all of my upcoming distractions, military service. I hope and pray that God will use them to do something with the National Guard because I'm going to be away again and I'm really getting kind of tired of it. Wholeheartedly turning to God, turning away from evil, determining to do His will. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. That's talking about repentance and revival, returning. The biblical command, Matthew 6, verse 33, we sang, Seek first the kingdom of God. And when we say kingdom of God, what are we talking about? Remember when we were in Matthew, talking about the kingdom over and over again? What did I tell you to think of? When we read the word kingdom, think of what? Oh, come on. The rule and reign of God. To seek the kingdom of God means I'm seeking him to reign in my life, to be my king, to put myself under his kingship. Sarah, pay attention. All right? You're a big girl. You can listen. His righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All of the 
these things, he said, will be added to you. That's his will. Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. So God judges a nation. He starts with their gods, right? That's what he did in Egypt. He judged all of their gods, the, the, the ten plagues. In this case, we read about God breaking down the groves, the pillars, the Asherah, the Ashtoreth, the, the Greek Astarte, the fertility gods, the gods of sex and fertility. They worshipped the queen of heaven, Diana of the Ephesians in the uh, book of Acts, where they sacrificed their children. So what's really changed in our day? We worship money, we worship sex, we worship you know, abortion, we sacrifice our children. Fame and prosperity and entertainment. These are the values of the world. These are the marks, listen to me, these are the marks of a successful church in our day. Don't believe me? Call up somebody at IBSA and ask them, hey, tell me about that church over in, I don't care, pick a place, Rochester. Tell me about that church out, you know, Tabernacle Baptist. Tell me about Emmanuel Baptist Church. You know what they're going to tell you? Tell me about Atwood Baptist Church. Oh, great, great church. They got a music program, knock your socks off. They got a youth program. They got programs, programs, programs. They got a building that's debt free. They've got property. They've got money in the bank. That's a great church. Question, has God been there lately? How many people are being saved there? We count baptisms. That's a great thing to do if all those people that are getting baptized have been saved. Doesn't mean much when you're taking three and four year olds and dunking them into water and counting it as a baptism, as a salvation. And if the three or four year old is saved, praise God, it's a good thing. How many lives are being changed? What kind of impact are they having on the community around them? I don't care if they're debt free. Most churches, if you want to know the truth and you talk to a church growth consultant, they'll tell you most churches have too little debt because when we get rid of all our debt, we get complacent, we sit back and we get at ease in Zion. It's better to have a little bit of a challenge out there. I digress. God says, when you sought God, he was found of you. When they sought God, they enjoyed rest. Chapter 14 and verse 7, they enjoyed the land. God, Jesus said, I will give you rest in Matthew 11, verse 28. Notice the connection. It's not coincidental. It's essential. We maintain a high level of military defense, but neglect the condition of the heart. We look for economic prosperity. And we accept and we condone moral decline and moral malaise. I am sick to death of talking to so-called conservative politicians, and I'll get a little political here tonight, the rhino Republicans that don't care a, a whit about gay marriage or abortion or any of those things, as long as we have a thriving economy, that's all they care about. I'm a fiscal conservative, but a social moderate, they'll tell you. Don't you know that sin is a reproach to any nation? Righteousness exalts the nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. That's what we had going on for the last 20 or 30 or 40 years, if you ask me. Matthew 23 and verse 23, and you got to say, well, what's the alternative? I get it. I'm not, you know. Matthew 23 and 23, Jesus said, you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you should have done and left the others undone. Enough about that. Let's move on to number two. They enjoyed God's rest and peace. Number two, they enjoyed God's presence. Now, we've been talking about that a lot. Last Sunday, week before, is God here? Emmanuel Baptist, God is with us. Does that sound familiar? What we've been talking about. Look at verses one and two. The Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded. He went to meet Asa and said to him, Hear me, Asa and Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you're with him. If you seek him, you'll find him. If you forsake him, he'll forsake you. Here's a prophet 
being used to stir the hearts and consciences of the people. The text urges us to come into a deeper knowledge of the fellowship with God. The presence of God is not to be regarded lightly. Remember Phineas's widow. When the Ark of the Covenant was taken and Hophni and Phineas died and Eli died, she named her baby what? Ichabod. They said, cheer up, you've had a boy. You've had a masculine child. Any Jewish woman should have been proud of that. She said, it doesn't matter to me. The glory of God has departed. That meant everything. Where is the glory? God spoke to Joshua after the sin of Achan and said, I will not go out with you until you deal with that accursed thing. Samson didn't know that the glory of God had left him. He said, I'll go out like I used to. It'll be like the good old days. We'll go out and we'll have M night. We'll have VBS. We'll have programs. And God will fill up the church with a bunch of kids and families. He didn't have sense enough to know that the Spirit of God had left him. Moses knew it. He said, I'm not going to go unless you go with me. In Exodus 17 and verse 7, the people came and said, is the Lord with us or not? The presence of God means everything. Azariah didn't flatter or pander to the king. He didn't congratulate him for all of his victories and his reforms. He said, now go on to spiritual growth. So let's consider, first of all, the vulnerability of victory. 1 Samuel 15, 7, Samuel said to Solomon, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? To King David, David was riding high and enjoyed a period of victory and prosperity. And it was time for the kings to go out to war. He said, I'm going to sit this one out. And he went up on his roof. And you know the rest of that story. After a victory, beware. Success, listen, success can be fatal. After a victory, beware. We need to diligently seek the Lord in times of prosperity. God's blessing and goodness ought to humble us drive us to our knees it is the goodness of god that leads us to repentance romans said we saw elijah after his great victory on mount carmel running away from queen jezebel hiding out god comes and says elijah what are you doing here what are you doing here she wants to kill me I have no other reason. You might as well kill me now. Just let me die. You want to die? Go back and talk to Jezebel. She promised to do that. What a stupid thing to say. Consider the vulnerability of victory. How about the cost of godlessness? Verse 3 tells us that Israel was without a true God. The true God. Without his power. Without his presence. Without his blessing and his protection. Oh, they believed in God. But they were practical atheists, living as if there was no God with whom they would have to do. Proverbs 9 and verse 7 says, The wicked shall be turned into hell with all the nations that forget God. Jesus said, Apart from him we can do nothing. They were, once again, like chickens with their heads cut off. Running around, doing everything, just didn't really realize that they were dead. They were dead, they just hadn't realized it yet. Number two, they were without a, without a teaching priest. There was no word from God, Proverbs 9, 29 and 18. We've quoted it and quoted it and quoted it and quoted it. Where there is no revelation, where there is no word from God, the people cast off restraint. They perish. To see it illustrated, look no further than the days of the golden calf. The people become ungovernable. Why do you suppose the United States is going through all the woke nonsense and the critical race theory and the revision of history and the, the cancel culture and all the garbage that's coming out of our schools? They didn't teach that stuff in 1963 when they still had prayer and Bible reading in school. You're not getting that out of the Christian schools in this country. Boy, that woke culture is everywhere. 
Why are we seeing the brutality that we've seen in our streets? The division, the racial infighting. I'll tell you why, because we're not hearing from God. We're not hearing from God. They were without the law. No standard of right or wrong. They could decide for themselves what's right or wrong. Who told them that? The serpent back in the garden, remember? Ah, oh, you're not going to die. You can be like God. You can sort this all out for yourself. You can know good from evil all by yourself. And so there was lawlessness. Let me ask you this. I hope you do. I hope it's why you're here tonight. Do you hunger for the word of God? Remember what happened when they found the book of the law in Ezra's day or in Josiah's day when they were cleaning out the temple? Psalm 19, verses 1 through 11. He calls all of the glories of the word of God. Verse 10 said it is more desired to be more desirable than gold, even much fine gold. It's sweeter than honey of the honeycomb. Tragically, again, as I said last week, there's no real reason for me to explain to you why we're talking about this tonight in church, because this is exactly what's going on in our day. It's the experience of many quote-unquote believers and church members in our day. What's the solution? Verse 4, turn back to God and seek him with all our heart. Verse 4, when in their trouble they turned back to the Lord God and sought him, he was found by them. The vulnerability of victory, the cost of godliness, the price of sin. Look at verse 5 and 6. In those times there was no peace to the one who went out, nor to the one who came in. And great turmoil was in all the inhabitants of the lands. And the nation was destroyed by nation and city by city. And God troubled them with every adversity. Look no further than our own day. Why do you think... <laughs> Why do you think we have rioting in our streets? Why do you think we've got all this nonsense with the COVID? They're trying to draw it out and prolong it and prolong it and prolong it so that they can have some form of control. Why don't they have control? Because the people are uncontrollable because they don't have the word of God. They've abandoned the word of God. Why do you think what's happening in Afghanistan is happening in... in why is all this happening? Why are we being led by people that don't know what they're doing. It's the price of sin. Letter D, look at the reward of obedience in verse 7. You, be strong, and do not let your hands be weak, for, for your work shall be rewarded. Let me just give you a bunch of scriptures here. Joshua 1, 8. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe to do according to what is written in it, and then you will have, be prosperous and have good success. Zechariah 3 and 16, do not fear Zion, let not your hands be weak. Jeremiah 31 16, thus says the Lord, refrain the voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Galatians 6, 9, let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. James 4, and verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Don't give up. Seek the Lord. You will seek him and find him when you search with all your heart. Keep obeying, keep seeking, keep doing what's right. Number three, look at God's prevailing victory. We're going to come over to, we saw it in chapter 14, verse 9. Zira, the Ethiopian, came against them with an army of a million men and 300 chariots. He came to Marishah. And Asa went out against him, and they set the troops in battle array in the valley of Zephatha at Marishah. 
Asa cried out to the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing for you to help, whether this with many or with those who have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on you, and in your name we go against this multitude, O Lord. You are God. Do not let man prevail against you. And so the Lord struck Ethiopian, the Ethiopians before Asa and Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. Asa and the people who were with him purpose, pur pursued them to Gerar, and the Ethiopians were overthrown, and they could not recover, for they were broken before the Lord and his army, and they carried away very much spoil. Then they defeated all the cities around Gerar, and the, the fear of the Lord came upon them, and they plundered all the cities, for there was exceeding much spoil in them. And they attacked the livestock enclosures and carried off all the sheep and camels in abundance and returned to Jerusalem. God gave them a great victory. So we see two examples here, one positive and one negative. First of all, in chapter 14 and particularly verse 11, when Asa relied on the Lord, he cried out to God. He said, it's nothing for you. Help us. Look at his testimony. He declared the incomparability of the Lord and his dependence on him. Exodus 15, 11, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praise, doing wonders? This is the song of Moses after the sinking of the Egyptian army in the Red Sea, all their chariots, remember? You know the name Michael? I wish he was here tonight. You know what that means? Who is like God? That's what they said. God, who is like you? Who is like God? The battle is the Lord's. Jude 9, Michael the archangel was contending with the devil when he disputed with the body of Moses, dared not to bring against him any kind of a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuked you. You see, we rest in the Lord. That word in uh, chapter 14, it's used again in chapter 16 and verse 7 and 8, means to rely upon the Lord. We raise our Ebenezer. Hitherto the Lord has helped us, right? On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. The, the, I'm sorry, the Ethiopian army under Zir was crushed by Asa. They had a, a stunning victory. But then, but then, look at chapter 16. I'm almost done. Verses 1 through 6. The 36th year of the reign of Asa, Basha, the king of Israel, came up against Judah and, and built Ramah that he might let none go out and come into Asa, king of Judah. Asa brought silver and gold from the treasuries of the house. Here we go again. Let's go get some money out of the church. Steal the money that belongs to the Lord. He brought silver and gold from the treasuries of the house of the Lord in the king's house and sent to Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, who dwelt in Damascus, saying, Let there be a treaty between you and me. That's right, let's engage and ally ourselves with the world. Your father, my father and your father, see, I've sent you silver and gold that I stole from the temple treasury. I've sent you silver and gold. Come, break your treaty with Basha, king of Israel, so that he will withdraw from me. So Ben-Hadad heeded king Asa and sent the captains of his armies Against the cities of Israel, they attacked Aijon and Dan and Abej and uh, Maim and all the storage cities of Naphtali. What's a storage city? Where they stored what? Grain and rich, you know, whatever they had. They, it was just a city built to store stuff in. You know? It happened when Basha heard it. He stopped building Ramah and ceased the work, and King Asa took all Judah, and they carried away the stones and timber of Ramah, which Basha had used for building, and with them he built Geba and Mizpah. Good job. So what did he do? First of all, he allied himself with King Ben-Hadad of Syria, stole the money from the Lord's house. He kept Israel busy on the northern border so that he could recoup and fortify the south. Good plan, but it wasn't God's plan. And so he had an unprovoked attack from the north, and Hanani rebuked him of that. Second thing is, he rejected the prophet of God. He threw Hanani in prison, verses 7 through 10. That's a good thing. The prophet comes in, tells you what you don't want to hear, so just put him in prison. 
I'm doing it my way. It's like Abram this morning. He knew, he knew better than God. And in verse 12, in the 39th year of his reign, Asa became diseased in his feet, and his malady was severe. And yet his disease, he did not, in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but the physicians. He didn't seek God, he went to the physicians. Well, you say, what's wrong with that? Go to the doctor. Now, th these physicians were not, you know, medical doctors. They were witch doctors. They were sorcerers. They were soothsayers and mediums. So he consulted with the magicians of his day. And he died. And guess what? They honored him in his death. But you know what? He's still dead. So they had a nice big celebration and a, a parade when he died. But he's, you know, dead is dead. Still dead. And so here's our key verse, verse 9, one that I hope you have underlined. If not, grab a pencil. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you're going to have wars. I don't want to get off subject and editorialize here, but, you know, why not? I've been doing it all night already. <laughs> After 9-11, what happened? I can tell you what happened at our church. We had people coming out to prayer meeting every night. Every night. Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday the church was full, Sunday night the church was full. Monday, everybody went back to work, and it was like nothing happened. Oh, it still had people flew their flags. People still prayed for the troops. All of our school kids, every time we had chapel service, kids raised their hand, pray for the troops, pray for the troops. As one who's now a troop, we appreciate that. But what happened? Did we seek the Lord with all our hearts? Did we give our whole hearts to God after that? No. And what's the testimony here? In this you've done foolishly. From now on, what? You're going to have wars? It's been 20 years. And now we're going to supposedly end it. But we got a guy who's senile and doesn't know what he's doing, and so it looks like we're going to have more wars and more wars and more wars. Chapter 15 and verse 17 talks about wholehearted you know, obedience. We've been talking about wholehearted obedience, but look at verse 17. The high places were not removed from Israel. The heart of Asa was loyal in his days, except he didn't do anything to clean up those high places, pagan worship. He was no longer fully loyal to the Lord and no longer rejoiced as he did in verse 15. And he no longer had rest all around, but he had wars. Verse 15. We're to seek the Lord. What does that mean? Seek the Lord. Put no confidence in the flesh. Philippians 3 and verse 3. Put no confidence in the flesh. The arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. Be warned. 1 Kings 20 and verse 11. The king of Israel answered and said, Tell him, let not one who puts on the armor boast like the one who takes it off. Things may be going well. We may be experiencing a time of prosperity. We still need revival. We can't save ourselves. There is no political answer. There's no military answer. There's no answer in education. Acts 4.12 says there's no salvation in any other. There's no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. I know it's a different context, different need. I, I know that. But it's still true. There is no other Savior. 
There is no other hope for America. There is no other hope for the Southern Baptist Convention. There is no other hope for Emmanuel Baptist Church. Decatur. Thanks be to God, 1 Corinthians 15 and 57. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what they asked Abraham Lincoln? Is God on our side? Lincoln said, I don't know that. I'm more concerned with are we on his side. Things are going well. We've had a, a decent summer. You know, our numbers have been flat. So that they've been flat for eight years. I, I'll tell you, we've had some ups and some downs, but it's all averaged out. We are hitting the average right now. Our offerings right now are higher than they've been at any time since I've been here. I think we've got a good spirit in the church. Everybody's getting along. There's no conflict. There's no problem that I'm aware of. <coughs> Do we need revival? Yeah. Yeah, we do. This is not as good as it gets. Look, our building's paid for. We've got money in the bank. We're making repairs. That's all good. That's all good. I've met in places that were way, way, way worse than this. Okay? We need God. We need the Spirit of God. We need revival. And we can't live without it. The sad fact is we can continue without it and be like that chicken with the head cut off. But unless we're in touch with our head, Jesus Christ, we're dead men walking. Father in heaven, how desperately we need you tonight. We plead with you, Lord. You said in your word, if we seek your face, we'll find you. As I said this morning, how foolish it is to claim to be seeking you when we're running away from you and hiding things that we don't want you to see. Father, deal with us in the secret places in our hearts. Cleanse us. Lord, Man looks at the outward appearance, but you see the heart. And so, Lord, we know our hearts are desperately wicked and deceitful. Cleanse us. Turn our hearts back to you. Father, come and revive your work. In the midst of the years, revive your work, Lord. In your wrath, remember mercy. And revive us again that we might rejoice in you. In Jesus' name we pray.